Hi, good evening and welcome. Um, my name is Teresa Severance, and I am a professor in the Department of Sociology and Criminology here at Eastern. Um, I may not seem like an obvious choice to be introducing Mr. Lamb, but hopefully you'll see that connection as we continue um, through the evening. Um, so welcome to An Evening with Wally Lamb. Uh, Wally Lamb is the author of six New York Times best-selling novels, I'll Take You There, We Are Water, Wishing and Hopin', The Hour I First Believe, I Know This Much Is True, and She's Come Undone. He was twice selected for Oprah's Book Club. Lamb also edited Couldn't Keep It To Myself and I'll Fly Away two volumes of essays from students in his writing workshop at York Correctional Institution, see, uh, a woman's prison in Connecticut, where he has been a volunteer facilitator for the past 17 years. And I'll take you there, Lamb weaves an evocative, deeply affecting tapestry of one baby boomer's life, Felix Vinicello, introduced in Wishing and Hopin, and the trio of unforgettable women who have changed it in this radiant homage to the resiliency, strength, and power of women. The audio dramatization features an all-star cast, including Kathleen Turner, Dana Delaney, Jonathan Davis, Laura Benanti, and Jeremy Sisto. Excuse me. Lamb is also the editor of the nonfiction anthologies Couldn't Keep It to Myself, Testimonies from Our Imprisoned Sisters and I'll Fly Away, collections of autobiographical essays which evolved from the writing workshop he facilitates at Connecticut's York Correctional Institute, a maximum security prison for women. He has served as a Connecticut Department of Corrections volunteer at York since 1999, and his work there was the focus of a 2004 segment on CBS TV's 60 Minutes. Wally Lamb is a Connecticut native who holds bachelor's and master's degrees in teaching from the University of Connecticut and a master's of fine arts in writing from Vermont College. He and his wife, Christine, live in northeastern Connecticut and are the parents of three sons, Jared, Justin, and Teddy. Please join us in welcoming back to Eastern Wally Lamb. First of all, um, I'd like us to just take a few seconds um, uh, to think about the, uh, the poor and the suffering and, uh, and the uh, deceased in, um, in the Ukraine. And secondly, I would like to say, hooray for us, a live event. I haven't done one of these in a couple of years, so. Uh, <laughs> thank you so much for showing up. Um, so I became a fiction writer. I started writing stories uh, back in 1981. Um, but I think I, I was preparing uh, to be a fiction writer long before that. Um, I think I would have to go back to the year 1960. Um, I was uh, nine years old, and uh, I was a public school student growing up in Norwich, 
down the road. Uh, but um, I was required by my mom, who was a practicing Catholic, for, to, I had to go to catechism once a week on Wednesday after school. And um, so I would trudge uh, from Broad Street School uh, to St. Patrick's School uh, next door to the cathedral down there. And um, there I was met along with my, uh, my classmates, uh, public school classmates who were also going to catechism. We were met by Sister Mercy, um, who, as I recall, was not very merciful. Uh, I could, I could sort of um, sympathize with her. Uh, this was the baby boomer generation, and um, she had been working with probably 32, 35 parochial school, school students all day. And then uh, now here we come, about uh, 30 to 35 uh, public school students, and um, we were not necessarily well behaved. Um, there were no happy campers in catechism, including sister. Uh, I was int intimidated by the whole thing, and I would sort of fade to the back of the room and try to blend into the wainscoting uh, because sister did a lot of slapping against desks with rulers and so forth, and kids did a lot of misbehaving. But one day, I don't know why to this day, I wanted sister to like me or if she couldn't do that, to at least notice me. So um, I remember she said, class dismissed. And everybody ran like hell for the, uh, for, the, for the door and down the stairs and out freedom once again. But I stayed behind. And I approached sister's desk. Um, she was already sitting at her desk correcting papers from the day from her parochial school students, and she didn't notice me at first. So I stood there waiting, and finally she looked up, and she said, yes, what is it? And I said, I didn't know what to say, but um, I said something that was um, nonfiction. I said, uh, sister, my grandfather grew up in Italy, and um, the scowl stayed on her face, and I could tell that she wasn't particularly interested where my grandfather had grown up. Uh, and so I said, and when he was a boy, there was a volcano that started to erupt, and he was the only one who was up early. And so he went around the village, and he was banging on people's doors and trying to get them to, um, you know, to, to, to go away. Uh, get into safety. And I could tell at this point, and this was probably creative nonfiction that I was telling. And, uh, and so I could tell that I had engaged sister a little bit. Um, she was looking up and, and uh, I had her attention, um, but it, I, didn't, I hadn't quite pushed her over the edge. So I said, And the Pope gave him a medal, at which point Sister smiled broadly. She reached into her bottom drawer, pulled out a holy picture, and uh, gave it to me. And the following, uh, the following uh, Wednesday, I had um, seating in the front. She knew my name, and uh, when there was a note to be sent to the principal, you can probably guess who she picked to send it. Um, so I learned at a fairly, uh, a fairly early age that um, if you take the truth and lie like hell about it, you know, riches can be yours. Now, um, I didn't uh, then turn into a pathological liar or a crooked politician. Um, I eventually became a high school English teacher. Uh, and that, uh, that was, I, I started teaching at the Norwich Free Academy, which was the school where I had gone to, to high school. Um, and um, I, uh, I, I did that job for about nine years. And I was, I was in the middle of that um, when I started writing. Um, I hadn't planned on it. 
I didn't know really how to write fiction. Um, but my, my, wife and, my wife had just delivered our first kid, our, our son Jared, uh, who is now uh, about 40 years old. And um, for some reason, fatherhood and fiction writing became like twins to me. Um, one sort of motivated the other and vice versa. So um, I worked away from 1981 to 1992. Um, I had finished the novel, which became She's Come Undone, and, um, and it was published on July the 4th weekend, uh, 1992. Uh, I got a phone call about two weeks after the book had come out. And uh, my wife was uh, making supper. Uh, the kids were around, uh, Jared and his younger brother, Justin, uh, and I was doing laundry. Um, I was moving clothes from the, from the washer to the dryer. Uh, my son Jared picked up the phone when it rang, and uh, he never was very, um, he never mastered um, phone etiquette, by the way. And so he said, Dad? And I said, yeah, phone. So um, I, went over, I, went, I went to the phone, uh, and a woman said, is this Wally? And I said, yes. And she said, what are you doing, Wally? And I said, laundry. And she started laughing. And uh, I said, who is this? And she said, uh, this is Oprah Winfrey. I didn't believe her. I didn't, who was playing a prank on me? So um, uh, I'm, I'm uh, pointing to my wife, because uh, after a while in the conversation, it, her imitation of Oprah got too good. And so I realized, oh, it really was she. And so um, I'm pantomiming to my wife, Chris, you know, it's Oprah. It's Oprah. And um, she's not getting it. She's like, dope, the Pope, you know, she, uh, she was completely lost. Anyway, um, Oprah, the reason why she called, and there was no Oprah's book club back then in 1992, but she said, um, she was an avid reader that she, um, she could say that reading saved her life from an unhappy childhood. Uh, she would go to the library once a week and get a stack of books and then um, uh, tune out of her, you know, pretty, pretty difficult childhood. And um, so she said, I love to read, and when I read a book that, um, that I really enjoy, I try to track down the author to say hi and to say thank you. And I'm like, I was sort of in disbelief. I'm like, uh, yeah, no problem, you know? Uh, and, uh, uh, but that, that was just a lovely call. It didn't have anything to do with the show. It was just a reader and a writer connecting. Um, jump forward five years. Now she does have a book club uh, that is wildly popular. And every book that she selects shoots to the top of the bestseller list. Um, she called back, uh, that was 1997, and she said, hi, Wally. And I said, oh, hi, Oprah. <laughs> and she said, um, are you still doing the laundry? And, and I said, yes, as a matter of fact, I am. Now, my wife is somewhere in the audience, I think, tonight. And um, she hates it when I tell this story because she would tell you that um, out of our 44 married years, I have maybe done the laundry like .007 or eight times. In uh, uh, but uh, but anyway, she just happened to catch me at the right moment, Oprah. Um, and uh, so uh, I was the third. I think I was the third of her book club choices, and um, it was pretty overwhelming. Uh, very exciting. I was on the show and so forth. Uh, and then I went back. Um, that was, that, was, uh, that was for my first novel, She's Come Undone. Uh, but I had been working on my second novel for about almost six years. And the following year, I finished that novel, and it was published. Uh, and uh, Oprah called again. And she said, oh my god, I love this novel. We're going to do, do you again. Uh, and so um, you know, I had two rides on the Oprah's Book Club roller coaster. Well, um, 
that was great, but it was also pretty intimidating because suddenly um, I wasn't writing for myself. I was writing for the millions of people who are now were waiting for my third novel. And uh, it shut me down. I was, I was scared to death to write the first sentence. And uh, I struggled for quite a while with that. Um, anyway, um, I kept scratching my head and saying, OK, why me? You know, uh, There are so many writers in America who are better than I am. I don't know why I got, why I got tapped with the magic wand not only once, but twice. Um, and I decided I couldn't figure out why, uh, but because it had happened, um, I owed the universe something. I had to, I, w I was really compelled to give something back um, because I had been, uh, you know, really gifted uh, twice. And right about that time, I got a call from the librarian at the York Correctional Institute. And uh, that's a fancy word for York Prison. Um, and the person I talked to was the librarian at the prison. And she said, uh, we're in trouble down here. Um, we, uh, at the time, uh, the governor was John Rowland. And he had been elected uh, on a campaign uh, in which he promised that when he was in charge, Connecticut prisons were not going to be like club meds. And um, he decided that one of the things he could do was cut back on psychiatric services. And so he did. And um, the women were struggling. And two or three of them had committed suicide. And, um, and there were several more attempts. So there was this sort of um, despair that had infected the institution. And the librarian was calling to say, we're we're reaching out to people to, just to distract the women. And um, we're wondering if you could come and talk about your work. And so um, I didn't want to do it. Um, I, uh, I hemmed and hawed, but I have a terrible time saying no to people. And so finally, I committed. What I, what I committed to was um, a 90-minute class, one time, one class, and then I'd be done with my obligation. Um, I'm going to read something. I'm not all that coordinated, so I'm probably going to drop something if I try to hold a microphone and read so out of a book, uh, but I'll give it a shot. Um, this, this is from a book that was eventually published in 2003, and it was called Couldn't Keep It to Myself. Um, let's see, what's the full title? Uh, Wally Lamb and the Women of York Correctional Institution. And in the introduction, I tell the story of what happened during that first meeting um, when I went down to Niantic and met with them. Dressed identically in cranberry t-shirts and pocketless jeans, the women came in all colors, shapes, sizes, and degrees of gender identification. Their attitudes ranged from hangdog to the Queen of Sheba. Most had shown up not to write, but to check out that guy who was on Oprah. I spoke. We tried some exercises. I asked if anyone had questions about writing, and several hands shot up into the air. Yes? You met Oprah? Uh, yeah, yeah, I did. Second question. What's Oprah like? Third question. Oprah's cool, you know what I'm saying? Well, at the end of my talk, one of the women stood and she thanked me for coming, and then she pitched me a curveball. You coming back? She wanted to know. Well, 30 pairs of weary eyes were upon me, and my index card was back in the office. This is an index card that I use. Um, it's like a little script that I use to say no to people. Um, and uh, I didn't have that card. And so I said, oh, uh, well, uh, uh, yeah, OK. Um, you write something, and I'll see you in two weeks. Any subject, two pages minimum, and your drafts will be your ticket back into the workshop. OK? And they nodded. And then at session two, 15 of the 30 chairs were empty. Stacy wanted praise, not feedback. 
Manhattan said she meant to be vague and nonspecific, that her business wasn't necessarily any other people's business. Ruth must have thought she was a guest on Oprah. She had written only a short paragraph, but man, oh man, did she want to talk. At age 55, Diane was the senior member of the group, and for 90 minutes, she hunched forward, fists clenched on her desktop, and her suspicious eyes followed my every move. Diane had written under a pseudonym, Natasha, and she had exacted a promise from me before class that her work was never, ever going to be read aloud. I predicted she would go, be gone by the third session. But it was during session three that Diane Bartholomew raised her shaky hand and she couldn't keep her writing to herself. She asked, could she read what she, could she share what she had just written? And then in a barely audible voice, she read a disjointed two-page summary of her really horrific life story. Incest, savage abuse, spousal homicide, lawyerly indifference, and then in prison, parallel battles against breast cancer and deep, dark depression. When she stopped, there was silence, a communal intake of breath. And then there was applause, a single pair of hands at first, joined by another pair of hands, and then by everyone. Diane had sledgehammered the dam of distrust and the women's writing began to flow. Soon after Diane dropped the pseudonym of Natasha, she discovered a writing voice as plain spoken and unvarnished as she is. Bartholomew dedicated herself to the purpose of recording her life with a fury the likes of which I had never witnessed. She wrote so much that she began to understand how writing works. And because of that, she became an astute and generous critic of the other writers. She hungered for critical feedback from her peers, but she always deflected praise with a shrug and a breaking of eye contact. Yeah, well, I don't know if it's any good or not, she would mumble, but at least it's honest. Her writing transformed her. You know, I always used to tell people that someday I was going to write my story, but I never really believed it would happen, she told me once. And now that it was happening, she couldn't stop. On alternate Thursdays, when I visited, the unassuming Diane would ambush me on my way to class, eager to swap her latest installments for the text I had taken home and critiqued for her. She began to color code her printed versions so that I could focus on what was new in the piece, what she had added, cut, switched, or clarified. She was a ravenous consumer of whatever I could teach her. I don't want to hog your time, Wally, she would whisper before class, but if you could give me a few extra minutes afterward. And then as soon as class was over, she would jump up from her seat and fan her work across the long tables, picking my brain about form and narrative flow. Now, do you think my hunting piece should go before or after the one about our trip to the beach? She would ask. Oh, and Wally, I've been thinking about something. What you said last time, how the car seems to be my main symbol, but I don't think it's the car. I think it's the open road. She would nod at the 14 or 15 pieces she had spread across the table. Yeah, yeah, it's the road, Wally, not the car. She could be impatient. She couldn't help it. The more her writing came to matter her, to her, the more unbearable those two-week turnarounds became. And so, with the warden's permission, she began faxing her work to my office. I would be in one room writing my novel in progress, one hard one sentence after another, and uh, the fax machine would whir, and uh, I, at the end, uh, the phone would ring uh, in the adjacent room, the fax machine would whir, and 15 minutes later, I would have maybe one or two more sentences written, and there would be a new 10-page draft waiting for me from Diane. Good God, Diane, I finally said. Joyce Carol Oates doesn't write this fast. What are you doing, writing a full-length book? Yeah, maybe I am, she said. And if so, I'm going to dedicate it to my dead mother. 
Her whole life, everybody kept telling her how stupid she was, same as they did me. I'm going to hold up that book and tell her, wherever she is, hey, look, Ma, look what your daughter did. I guess we weren't so stupid after all. Diane's productivity was daunting. Her mission to get her life down on paper nearly monomaniacal. And I didn't understand the timetable under which she was laboring. Now, because York is a maximum security prison, volunteers are forbidden to give gifts to the inmates. Contraband goods entering the facility can become a serious and safety risk, um, security risk. And so on a pre-Christmas of 2000 visit to the compound, I arrived empty-handed. But Diane Bartholomew had a gift for me. It was a simple card. The message she had written inside said, so many times I wanted to throw in the towel and give up. But you, more than anyone, Wally, know my character by now. I wasn't a pest all my life for nothing. Wally, we all look forward to Thursday afternoon like little children waiting for a treat. The treat is the opportunity to share our stories and to get the feedback that makes our work worthwhile. To say thanks sounds hollow. And as you always say, show it, don't tell it. So let me put it this way. You have become the umbilical, war, umbilical cord for a rebirth of hope in me. Please thank your wife and your boys for sharing you with us women here at the prison. By January of 2001, Diane's cancer was diagnosed and um, she found out that it had spread to her lymph nodes. Misdiagnoses delayed her treatment for several months. Each time I visited the compound, Diane seemed weaker, her energy at a lower and lower ebb, her voice more thin and whispery. She came late to some sessions and left early to others. And once during her chemotherapy started, she was too sick to come at all. By special permission, I visited Diane in the medical unit. Was there anything I could do for her? And she said, yes. I'm planning to beat this thing because I have so much of my story left to write. But in case I don't make it, Wally, would you finish my story for me? I told her I didn't think I could promise that. All the more reason for her to get well, I said, and to write it herself. One afternoon in May, the principal, vice principal of York School, Mary Graney, wheeled by Bartholomew unexpectedly into a workshop meeting. She was bald and kerchiefed by then, ravaged by her treatments. She had reclaimed some of her Natasha-like secrecy too. And while the other women worked at their word processing stations, she passed me a private note. It said, I may be getting out of here. The parole board is going to meet to discuss my case. Diane, that's great, I whispered back. Maybe they're finally going to show you a little mercy. That made her chuckle. It had nothing to do with mercy, she said. It had to do with the cost of cancer treatments. Diane was released from prison the following month, halfway through her 25-year sentence. She returned without fanfare to the house where 13 years earlier she had killed her abusive husband. I made a half dozen visits to Diane's home, the first few times with one of the other teachers and then by myself. I brought flowers and lunches and good wishes from the writing group. I located and installed a used computer for her so that she might continue her story but she used it instead to compose thank you letters to the people who had supported her while she was in prison. You know, it's strange, she said. As much as I hated that place, I miss it. I miss the people. I wonder how this one's doing and that one. I didn't realize that freedom would feel so lonely. In October of 2001, I spoke at a fundraiser for a shelter for battered women 
held in Hartford at the governor's mansion. Security was tight in the wake of September 11th attacks and the anthrax scares, but the mansion had been decked out for Halloween and the event was crowded. During my presentation, I described the writing workshop at York and read a portion of Diane's autobiography. When I finished, the applause was extended and genuine. Several people asked me to relay their good wishes and their prayerful intentions. I drove to Diane's later that week on a beautiful Indian summer day. We sat in the sun on the upstairs porch outside of her bedroom, and I filed my report on the fundraising event. So, I said, what do you think of that, Miss Big Shot? Everyone at the governor's mansion getting off their butts and cheering and standing to, to, and standing to celebrate your writing. Diane shrugged. Well, I don't know if it's any good or not, but at least it's honest, she said. And then she held out her hands, palms up, and I took them in my hands, my fingers curling around hers. For the rest of that visit, neither of us said much. Diane dozed, her face to the warm sun. She was done now with words, but having in the last two years of her life written 30,000 of them, roughly a third of her story, she had left behind a legacy. Her sister Katie called me on Thanksgiving evening, and she was succinct. Diane died, she said. I drove to the funeral home. More than once during the workshops, Diane had seen fit to inform us that as a young woman, she had been quite a looker. At her wake, the snapshots and framed pictures arranged around her coffin proved that she had been right. I shook hands with her family, daughters, siblings, in-laws. I had never met but knew them all through Diane's writing. And after paying my respects, I retreated to the back of the room where I was joined by Robin Cullen, a workshop member who had been released from York Prison the year before. Between the family up front and the three of us, there were dozens of empty chairs. Look at that, Robbins whispered. Diane saved seats for all the women who would have come if they were free. I, uh, I haven't read that for quite a while, and um, it still has the, uh, the ability to make me tear up when I think of, when I think of Diane. Um, so, uh, I kept writing, I kept going down to the prison. What I, realized, what I thought was gonna be a one-time commitment, 90 minutes, turned into 20 years. Um, I didn't teach by myself. Uh, I had a lot of helpers with the writing program. Uh, Dale Griffith, Karine Jennings, Doug, Ho Doug Hood, Susan Cole, and Allison Salazar. Um, the reason why I stayed as long as I did was because the women were teaching me. I was telling them what I knew about writing, and they were telling me what they knew about life, uh, particularly their lives, which had been very different than my own. And so I was able to stretch and grow beyond my own limited experiences. Um, and it's something that changed my life. Um, the book that I was reading for, from uh, was published in 2003. That was Couldn't Keep It to Myself. Um, in 2007, we published the second anthology, something called I'll Fly Away. Now, in that time, I was also writing my novels. Um, I completed four more, and um, I was so lucky, so fortunate, um, that they, they all climbed up the, the bestseller list. Um, we were working on a third anthology um, by the women, um, something that we titled You Don't Know Me, The Incarcerated Women of York Prison Voice Their Truths. Um, 
I worked on that novel, editing it for about two years, you know, along with my own writing. And um, the galleys were printed. Uh, it was two weeks before the release uh, of, of that book uh, when I was surprised, taken aback by a lawsuit um, that I hadn't seen coming. The plaintiffs were two of the contributors whose work was in the anthology, uh, and uh, both of these women had uh, been released from the prison. Um, I was not the only defendant in this lawsuit. Um, also named were the publisher of the book, the literary agency that represents me, and my literary agent personally. Now, it was tough going. The lawsuit languished. Um, court dates were postponed. It dragged on for a couple of years. Um, in that time, the book company decided to cancel the publication. Um, and at that point, I was um, in agreement with that. Um, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the course of those events, um, I was investigated by the Department of Correction. Uh, based on some of the accusations that were made. Um, I was told uh, by the administrators to stay away from the prison. Um, our writing group had been suspended. Um, the investigation was done. I was cleared of any wrongdoing, and the program was reinstated. Um, it had not met for about four months. Um, when we finally could go back to the prison and, uh, and, and, and get back to the work of the women, um, I was hassled by a new administrator um, who said, no, we couldn't meet. Um, we would have to wait some more uh, because she needed to learn about this whole situation. So we were told to go home. Um, that was painful. And the lawsuit eventually was settled out of court, um, but I signed a gag order, so I can't tell you what the agreement was. Um, it was all too much. I threw in the towel, and in year number 20, uh, I resigned for the program. My co-teachers continued to teach the class, um, and they did that right up until COVID hit. Um, they were told when the volunteer programs were able to resume that they would have to drive to Wethersfield and be retrained. Um, and now they had reached the end of their limit. And so they resigned and the writing program is no more. Um, this is the book that never was. You Don't Know Me, The Incarcerated Women of York Prison Voice Their Truths. It was ready to go. This was the galley or the advanced reading copy. Uh, but the book died on the vine. Uh, and 12 women's voices were silenced until today. I'm. Uh, I'm going to practice a little bit of civil disobedience here. And um, I want to share with you uh, some of the stories that are in this book that nobody has read. Um, and I'm going to start with something by Susan. She says this. When people find out that I used to rob banks, the number one question they ask is how it all started. I mean, what were you thinking, Susan? My answer is easy. I wasn't thinking. But that's not the truth, not the whole truth. So what was I thinking? What could possibly have been running through my wig-clad head as I staked out my first bank? Well, I'll tell you. I was in kindergarten the first time I stole something a dictionary-sized stack of multicolored construction paper. Bubbles of excitement fizzed inside me as I slid the stack into my backpack and zipped it up. 
Once safely on the school bus, I felt a shiver go up and down my spine. I had gotten away with it. Walking through the front door at home, I said to my brother, Stephen, look at all the paper I got. At our house, the arts and crafts supply amounted to a coffee can of dried up pens and some yellow lined legal pads. <clears throat> so actual construction paper was like manna dropped from heaven into our living room. Stephen and I quickly set up production on the floor, folding paper into hats, boats, airplanes. Our mom was busy in the kitchen and didn't notice my brother and I rolling in our construction paper windfall, feeling as rich as Scrooge McDuck. And then the phone rang. Of course, I got caught. I was a dumb little five-year-old whose blonde hair and Kool-Aid mustache was not exactly suited for a post office wanted poster. I never could figure out how my teacher, the smock-wearing Mrs. Cunningham, figured out that I was the perp. I mean, she talked to sock puppets, and then suddenly she was the Sherlock Holmes of art supplies. Susan Rachel, my mother yelled. Uh-oh. I was made to gather up my ill-gotten gains, and we all piled into the family minivan for the trip back to school. I sat between the brother whom I had made my unwitting accomplice and my baby sister who jabbered away, blissfully unaware that she was strapped in next to a criminal. Mom was deathly silent the whole way, hitting the brakes extra hard at every stop sign. Mrs. Cunningham met us outside and I handed over the stolen goods. I don't recall anything about the long lecture I'm sure I got from my parents that night. What I do remember was what happened the next day. The first thing Mrs. Cunningham did was tell the whole class in her sweet sing-song voice about my offense. I was then made to stand at the front of the room while my classmates lined up to approach me. Mrs. Cunningham had taught them that thing where you rub your index finger down your other one. And so one by one, they passed in front of me doing that finger thing and saying, shame on you, Susan, 19 times, including Mrs. Cunningham. Shame on you, Susan. The truth is, I was thinking as I sat outside waiting to rob my first bank. I was thinking, in and out, two minutes, a clean, fast getaway. I was thinking, do this or lose everything. I was thinking, shame on you, Susan. Shame on you. Uh, this next one is called The Essay. And it's about a woman named Mary um, who is doing uh, um, several years, I think 35 years, um, for a uh, a drunken related murder uh, that was committed at a bar. This one is called The Essay. Mom, come on, we're gonna be late. I'm getting dressed as fast as I can, I called back from behind the bedroom door. <clears throat> and then I took a good hard swallow, feeling the heat as the vodka slid down my throat. This was gonna be a long night and I need to fortify myself. It was the evening of the school assembly and my daughter, Tina, was excited about being in the initial class of D.A.R.E., a program that had been introduced in Connecticut's grammar schools in hopes of reducing the growing alcohol and drug problems affecting the preteen population. Please, Mom, I want you to sit up front so that you can see me when I get my teddy bear. Each child would be awarded a certificate signed by President Jimmy Carter and a stuffed bear wearing a t-shirt that said, hugs, not drugs. Since our last name began with A, Tina would be the first in the, of the program's graduates. Up front was not at all where I wanted to be. Having grown up in a suburban town where teenage pregnancy was a rarity, I had given birth to Tina when I was just 17. Now, I was 27. I had separated from her father and moved back to my hometown. Tina was attending the same grammar school that I had, and she even had some of the same teachers. 
I would undoubtedly be the youngest parent in that auditorium. The later we arrived, I figured, the less time I would be forced to socialize. Still, I didn't want to disappoint my daughter. One more chug from the water bottle I had filled with vodka, a handful of peanuts to cover the smell, a mint after that, and I was ready. I dropped the bottle into my purse, closed the bedroom door, and joined my anxious daughter in the living room to wait for her father to pick us up. On the ride to, school, to the school, Bob and I were in the front. Tina buckled up and back. Hey, Mary, your eyes look a little red, he whispered. I hope you didn't overdo it. Bob was a drinker, too, but he had a better grip on it than I did. He could say no, and he did whenever the situation called for it. I got this, I whispered back. The front seats of the auditorium were already taken, but Bob and I sat about four rows from the front of the stage, further back than Tina had wanted, but close enough so that we could see her and she could spot us. All around us, conversations ensued about which child belonged to which parent, who their friends were, and how important the D.A.R.E. program was in educating them about the dangers of substance abuse. As the program began, everyone quieted down. The principal welcomed us and then introduced the local police department officer who had mentored the students. And then each student walked across the stage to receive her, his or her certificate and a teddy bear. To Bob's and my surprise, Tina's teacher, Mrs. Robinson, took the microphone and announced that Tina Ames has been chosen as the first place winner of the essay contest and now would read what she had written. Tina took the mic. Her first words were, my mom is an alcoholic. My face flushed and I slouched down in my seat. Bob looked over at me, shock on his face. It's hard when my mommy drinks. Sometimes she yells at me for no reason and sometimes she falls asleep and it's hard to wake her up. As Tina continued, I entered a state in which everything seemed to be happening in slow motion. I could feel the audience member's eyes turning to me. That one, I heard someone say, that's the mother. Breathing became difficult and that water bottle in my purse was calling to me. I was certain that everyone around me knew that it was in there. I did not want to hear that what Tina was saying. I only wanted to escape what was happening and drink from that bottle until it was empty, but I couldn't move. She thinks I don't know why she acts crazy, but I do. It's because she's drunk. She embarrasses me in front of my friends a lot. Tina kept talking, people kept staring, I kept listening, and then I began to cry. I had been a drinker pretty much all of Tina's life. I had fooled myself into believing it didn't affect her, or if it did, not too much. I was always there to see her off to school in the morning and help her with her homework when she came home. I cooked, kept an immaculate house, and always showed up for those parent-teacher conferences. I loved my daughter, but I also loved my vodka, and I didn't feel I had to choose between them. It's because of watching her that I made the pledge to never, ever drink. Those, works, those words hit hard. I just wish my mom knew how much I love her and my, how much I worry about her when she drinks too much. These would be words that would echo in my mind as I began my battle for sobriety. But before I could do anything, I had to get through the rest of the D.A.R.E. program, graduation night, with all those parents judging me and more importantly, my daughter's revelations about my terrible truth. I'm going to grab a little water. This is by a woman named Christina. It's called Summer 1981, 192 Westland Avenue. I'm not sure, but I think that might be in Bridgeport. She writes as a child. I'm having a tea party with Raggedy Ann and Andy and my big white teddy bear 
when I hear the neighborhood kids' voices coming in through the open window. They're laughing and they're playing and having fun. Mom, can I go outside? Yeah, but don't let the street light catch you. Running back to my room, I abandon my tea party guests and slip my feet into my clogs. They're white with white leather straps, silver clasps, and wooden buttons. I feel grown up when I hear the click clack of the wood on the stairs. We live on the third floor. When I get to the first floor landing, I see David, the landlord's son, by the basement door. David has lots of dogs. Sometimes from our bedroom window, I watch him feeding and playing with them. He asks me, do I want to see the puppies? Of course I do. David opens the basement door. I'm afraid of the dark, but I follow him down the stairs. I can smell wet grass, mothballs, and dog poop, and I can hear the puppies barking, and I hear birds chir chirping. When I reach the bottom step, I'm drawn to the glowing fish tank, the biggest one I've ever seen. The fish are all different colors, blue, yellow, orange, silver. Looking away from the tank, I see birds and snakes in cages, and the puppies and rabbits. David lives in a zoo. I don't realize David has picked me up until I'm on his bed. When he reaches up and pulls on a string, the room starts changing colors. I try to catch them as they move past me. I'm not paying attention to what David is doing until I feel the hot, burning pain. I don't remember getting off the bed, up the basement stairs and back into our apartment. There's my mother at the kitchen sink, but she's in black and white. I don't know why I'm moving in slow motion. I walk to my room and I hide in the darkness of my closet. I'm holding my big white teddy bear. Writing this, I am a 39-year-old, six-year-old, living it all again. Um, I got to do a time check. Hold on. All right. I'll read. I'm going to, I'm going to skip two or three or more of them. Uh, there are some funny ones in here, but, um, I kind of want to read the last one, and it is, about, it is by a woman named Chastity. There are four um, lifers at York. She's one of them. She will never get out of prison. She entered prison in her 20s. And she writes here about time. Aristotle warned of the dangers of excess in his Nicomachean ethics realizing that spoil inevitably follows anything not measured in proper proportion. The same is true of time. You know, you got too much time on your hands is a modern expression that borrows Aristotle's notion of the ruin wrought by overkill. The purpose of time as it applies to punishment is to take chunks of it from an offender's life. Through the justice system, society sets the sanction according to how much it appalls us morally. Consequently, we dole out punishment in proportion of time, ranging from slivers of days or months, slabs of years, to a complete evisceration, an entire lifetime in prison. Arguably, serving a life sentence in prison is the most destructive form of having too much time on one's hands. Here, time becomes not just punishment, but a pathogen. A convicted offender's single worst moment triggers a permanent condition that spans the remainder of that person's life. In many ways, this dishonors the victim because it strips the prisoner of any responsibility to rise above the criminal deed and work toward change. Unlike other prisoners whose sentence and rehabilitation are intertwined, nothing is required of the lifer but time. Time can break a person, causing her to do things she ordinarily would never have done, 
to become someone she otherwise never would have been. Some turn to drugs, illegal or prescribed, as a coping mechanism. Some develop a nothing-to-lose attitude, succumbing to the hostile and antagonist atmosphere that is carried in each shift and permeates the population. Some implode, surrendering to self-destructive beha behavior. Others lose all hope. The most desperate are driven so far over the brink of despair that their only recourse is suicide. The pathological effect of time is not always revealed on the surface. Most long-term prisoners settle into their daily routine and do their time quietly. They get a hobby, find a niche, create a purpose for themselves, not only to pass the time, but also to make sense of their lives. But for me, a woman serving life without parole, time has become distorted, something I can no longer manage. I'm always late. I'm always scrambling, in a rush, blowing deadlines, leaving things incomplete or undone. My sentence has warped my concept of time, causing me to overestimate it and take it for granted, perhaps because for me, time has lost its value. The small annoyances that come with mismanaged time, tardiness, procrastination, haste, disorganization, cause me constant aggravation. It's not often visible to others around me, but there is a dark, insufferable gloom that clings to me. It's always there. Life in prison passes not by the clock, but by what goes on to indicate that time is ticking. Each formal body count means that five hours have rolled by. Shift changes mean eight hours. Tuesday is commissary day, marking the passage of another week since our last commissary. Guards rotate to new posts every 56 days. Quarterly facility shakedowns tell me, oh, three months have passed. When someone finally leaves prison at the end of a 10-year sentence, I realize that another decade has crept by. For the lifer, time moves not for you, but around you. <clears throat> the child who was a baby when you entered prison is on her way to the senior prom, an age progression viewed only through photographs. Advances in technology, the internet, iPods, texting, Twitter, these are experienced solely through magazine ads and television commercials. One day, a juvie puts a miss in front of your name and time's passage sucker punches you in the stomach. It's difficult to make the best of one's time when time overwhelms. No matter how productive I aim to be, my life, this life, feels purposeless when everything I strive toward aims to become, aim, everything I aim to become is sucked into the black hole of time. Last week I had a dream in which I was torn open trudging up a mountain, losing my footing on its jagged rocks. Cradling my spilled entrails with one hand, I pushed against a great black force with the other. That force, I now realize, was time. I awoke from that dream to the living nightmare of my reality, wondering what to do with time when it taunts you and tricks you, pushing its never-endingness against you. So um, those are some of the some of these stories that were never published. Um, but uh, I don't know. I remain optimistic that someday they will be. Uh, somebody will 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 see them and get excited about the women's voices that were silenced. Um, and I sure hope that happens. And um, can you direct me what happens next? Yes. So um, we have some questions from the audience. Um, I believe I will read them, or do we have people coming? Um, while you're mustering up your courage, uh, to ask uh, ask something or or tell me something, 
Um, I will tell you about a Q&A that I had once, once um, when I was reading to a kindergarten class. Um, uh, I was, I was uh, the royal reader uh, in Mrs. Parzik's uh, kindergarten class. And uh, it was a hot day near the summertime. And, um, and I arrived early, so I was playing in the playground with the kids, um, having a great old time. Uh, but um, when, we, when it was time for me to read the story, we went back in the classroom. And I never had been so confident in front of an audience before. The kids were mesmerized by the story, and we were having a great old time. And so with this burst of confidence, I said, now, before I turn the page, does anybody have a question? And this one little girl, they had name tags, and she, she raised her hand, and I said, yes, Fanny, what's your question? And she said, why are there wet marks under your arms? So um, <laughs> keeping in mind that I even answered that question, um, uh, feel free to uh, ask away. <laughs> question, Wally, is from a student here named Matt, and he says, do you have any tips for aspiring authors or writers right out of college? <laughs> uh, yeah, I do, um, and my, I'm not sure Matt wants to hear the answer, but, um, uh, but my, the, best, the best answer I can give is to humble yourself to the act of revision. Um, Nobody, very much including me, gets it right in the first draft. Um, you, you need to revise and revise and revise if you have any hope of publishing. Now, I work in a, in a writer's group. I always have. Um, we, my group and I meet every couple of weeks, and we read new stuff. And then everybody else um, sits around and um, tells you, first of all, what they what they liked, what they would engage them, and also um, what they think we need to work on. Um, when my work is being critiqued, I write furiously. I don't take part in the discussion. I just want to hear what people's reactions were. And I think if I could um, boil revision down into four different um, things, it would be this. When you revise, what do you need to add that's going to make it better? What's going to make it better if you cut out something? Um, what do you think you could rearrange within the text uh, to make it more effective? And um, what needs to be clarified? So lots of times when I'm in my writer's group and somebody says um, something like, you know, I was confused by what the grandmother said. And I'm writing feverishly, and I'm thinking to myself, yeah, right, what do you know? Um, but, but then somebody else says, yeah, that confused me too, and then a third person. And then it's like, aha, you know, they were right. I've got to go back and fix that. Um, so I'm always grateful uh, for feedback in my writing. And um, so Matt, um, humble yourself to the act of revising and maybe share your work with other writers or people you trust and people who are not necessarily just going to give you compliments and tell you how wonderful it is. Thank you. Um, the next question is about process, and so it's really well timed. It's from Quinn. How do you come up with the end of your novel before you begin writing it? Um, do, uh, the, how do I come up with the end of the novel before I begin writing? Um, man, I wish I could do that, uh, but I can't. I do know some fiction writers, and I've read about the work of fiction writers, some of whom I admire, um, who do that. Um, they, they know, they have a preconceived ending in mind. Um, the writer John Irving says, of course you can't write the first sentence of your novel until you know how it's going to end. But man, it doesn't work that way for me. Um, <clears throat> Uh, what happens with, with my process is that I become somebody that I'm not. I slip out of my own skin, and I write in first person as somebody else. And um, at the beginning of, the, of, a, of a novel, I'm a polite stranger to this other person. So as I'm writing in that person's voice, um, I'm learning about that person. 
um, I, I, I start to worry about the person because, of course, there's conflict involved. And, um, and I don't know if that person is going to come out OK or not. And so I have to keep writing to find out what's going to happen. That's, my, that's the carrot be before the horse. Um, I'm the horse, and the carrot is the ending of the story. Um, I, don't, I don't know how it's going to end until I'm usually finished with my, finishing up my, my first draft. Um, I'm sometimes relieved. I'm sometimes worried uh, by the ending of that. Um, but that's just my process. That's how, that's how I write. Um, I love writing as somebody else um, because I usually write about people who have different experiences and different problems than I've had. And um, so I stretch and grow beyond the limitations of my own experiences uh, when I become Dolores Price, who was raped when she was 13, or uh, Dominic Birdsey, who has a brother who is paranoid schizophrenic, a twin brother, um, or, uh, or a guy whose wife um, was a nurse at Columbine High School the day of the shooting. Um, these are some of my characters. And um, so I follow them uh, into, the, into the wilderness and hope that they and I will come out on the other end back into the light. Um, earlier, we were chatting about your emphasis on teachers. Uh, the, the, the character in The Hour I First Believed is a teacher. And even the opening to your introduction for um, The Hour, um, couldn't keep it to myself, you mentioned your, your love of teaching as an, as an adolescent. What relationship do you see between creative writing and teaching? Hmm. Well, you know, it's, it's funny. When I was, um, I mentioned the, you know, the Oprah Book Club thing happening twice. And then it was time to write a third novel. And because the first two had sold really well um, with Oprah's endorsement, um, they wanted to, they were, well, my agent got them to give me a lot of money, advance money, to write number three. And I was really intimidated. Um, and um, I was scared to write the first sentence because I had that thing called imposter syndrome. Oh, I fooled them twice, but um, my luck is going to run out. I can't fool them a third time. I really don't know how to do this. Um, and so it, it was tough going. Um, I was pretty much frozen. And that's about the time that I started working at the prison. Now, I had been a high school teacher at the North Tree Academy for about 25 years. And then I taught at UConn uh, for a little bit. Uh, I ran the creative writing program there. Um, and I thought I was done with teaching. I was, I was you know, poised to become a full-time writer. And then I got that call uh, about coming down and you know, the, my love of teaching sort of pulled me back uh, into the fray. And um, when I was writing uh, that third novel with a great deal of difficulty, um, that's when I was teaching. I thought they were two distinct um, and separate uh, things that I was doing, teaching and writing. But then they began to sort of cross-pollinate. Um, <clears throat> I, I found that teaching the women at the prison made me a better writer. And being a writer, writing about that Columbine tragedy made me a better teacher. Um, and so they crossed paths. And I think, I think I always want both in my life. Um, I had a great time. Uh, with the students I was lucky enough to work with earlier this afternoon. Um, and I just felt so much at home in the front of that classroom. And, you know, not so much, you know, um, lecturing the, the kids in that class, but um, interacting with them. You know, I'm selfish. I love to learn from my students. And I think that's what keeps me in the game. I neglected to uh, bring a pen with me tonight, so um, I'll just deliver my question. I was uh, struck by your, your uh, mention of creative nonfiction earlier, um, because when I've used that phrase with other people, they've looked at me and said, well, what's I'm, that? I'm, I'm sorry, I can't, I can't. No, no, I'm not going to ask you to define it. I, no, my, 
my question was about your uh, your work with the, the women uh, in the prison, and um, I was wondering in what measure you think the sort of introduction of the questions of craft and people's life writing involves either discovering form or imposing form or something else entirely. Mm -hmm. um, well, I don't like to impose anything. Um, uh, but I, but I love to sit back. The best classes that I have are the ones where um, the students are teaching one another. Um, critiquing somebody else's work um, is a skill like any other skill. You know, you can't sit down at a piano and play Beethoven if you've never sat down at a piano before. Um, so I had to kind of teach the students at the prison how to critique one another. Um, the first rule, you never make it personal. Focus on the work, not the person. Um, the second rule is, um, you know, why uh, don't, don't just give compliments, you know? Uh, somebody would say, I would say, how do you, how do you react to this? And uh, yeah, Brenda, um, I just thought it was great. Oh. Good. What did? What was great about it? I don't know. I just really loved it. Um, well, you really loved it. You thought it was great, but can you give me some specifics about that? Um, no, I just really enjoyed listening to it. Um, that's no help whatsoever. You know, you can celebrate what the writer accomplished in an early draft. Um, that's great, but um, you have to specifically get down to how that writer can make it better. And um, like I say, that's a skill that you learn with practice. And by about the second or third year, one of, one of the luxuries of working at the prison was that I had some students, not for a semester or for a year, but for, for years, um, they, many of them weren't going anywhere. And I kept showing up. And so they became better and better uh, at critiquing one another. And when I can sit in the back of the room and let them go at it and just sort of observe, man, I love that. I love that when, you, when they've accomplished that, um, you know, those skills that could do that. So um, eventually they, they start talking about form. They start talking about, you know, point of view and, and, and all those kind of things. And um, so, you know, we don't, we don't work with textbooks. Um, we work from experience. And sometimes I'll butt in, and sometimes I talk too much, but, uh, but I try not to. I try to, you know, I try to put the gag on and, uh, and let them make their own discoveries. Does that answer your question? Yes. OK, good. Hi, Wally. Thank you for being here. Um, your work has always stood out to me for its mastery of detail. So when you're in a scene, how do you know how much detail to include? How do you know when you have the right balance of detail? Um, when I'm in a scene, I think I, I, think I understood what you, what you were saying. When I'm in a scene, how do I know how much detail to include? Um, well, I, f I found that there are kind of two, two kinds of writers, fiction writers who are creating a scene, or nonfiction writers, too. Um, and some of us overwrite and some of us underwrite. And so um, I'm an overwriter, and I put, I put in too much in a scene. Um, what, I, what I'm able to do uh, is um, put it aside, wait till the next day, and read the scene again. And sometimes I know immediately what I should cut. Um, and the other type of writer um, usually has to figure out what's missing, you know, what needs to be added. Um, one of the things that I think is really important that I emphasize with my students is, um, I call it adverb disease. Um, you know, if you're writing, if you're writing, a, if your sentence has a verb and an adverb, um, better to find a verb that is more descriptive and throw out that adverb, all right? That's kind of like a technical thing. Um, but uh, I, uh, uh, oh, I lost my train of thought. But um, I, 
I, I, I like to I like to I like the things to cool down a little bit. Um, I revise relentlessly. Um, I write the first sentence of a scene. Uh, I fix that about six times, and then I write the second sentence, and then I go back and fix the first sentence again. And, and so my my writing is very plodding. Uh, it's um, it's not it's not a fast process, um, but um, I just find that that's the way to do it. Um, to put it aside for a while, and then sometimes it practically talks to you. It says, no, no, you don't need that sentence. That happened to me today. Um, I had written a scene yesterday in the novel that I'm working on now, and um, it kind of went on, and you know, and and the guy is talking about things that kind of, he just kind of, you know, went off in a different tangent, and I saw immediately that I had to hit hit delete, and. Um, and I think I, I think I strengthened it by doing that. Another interesting student question for you. Um, as a writer, Sam is asking, what is the hardest challenge that you face professionally as well as personally, and how do you face it? Um, personally, uh, the older I get. Uh, the, I, you know, I have, I have um, sometimes uh, I, have, I have trouble staying in the seat. <laughs> um, I work in, 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 my, in, our, in our basement in my house. I used to have, an, I used to have a, um, uh, rent the second floor of an apartment here in Willimantic and do my writing there. And one of the best things about that apartment was that there was no phone. Um, and cell phones were not around back then, uh, so texting wasn't wasn't around. Now my wife, um, Chris, you know our kids were young then, and if there, if there was a reason for me to have to come home, then um, you know she could call the downstairs. That, uh, this was a two-family house, and um, the person who lived downstairs was Bunny, <clears throat> my landlady, who was. Um, a very flirtatious 80-something-year-old woman. And uh, uh, one time, uh, she, and she used to always try to feed me things. So I would be upstairs writing, and she would knock, knock, knock on the door. And I would answer the door, and she would be there with, I don't know, cookies or gingerbread or something. Um, and um, one day, she said to me, Wally, were you knocking on my door downstairs? And I said, uh, no, Bunny, I wasn't. And she said, oh, I thought I heard somebody knocking. Um, I was vacuuming. And I said, oh, OK. And she hands me the gingerbread with a little bit of Cool Whip on top and a cherry. And I said, thank you very much. But she's just sort of, she tells me she's vacuuming. And then she's just sort of standing there. And I don't, I don't know what else to say. So she says. You know, some women vacuum in the nude. <laughs> and this is, here's my hand with, here's, here I'm holding the gingerbread, and my hand starts going like, like you know, like this. She was a lovely old gal. Uh, I, I had great fun with Bunny, but um, I don't know why I went off on that tangent. What was the question? <laughs> We're fine. <laughs> Hi, Mr. Lim. Well, nice to meet you. Um, first, I want to thank you, and I'm actually really grateful for having had heard the stories of those women that weren't shared before, I think, right here. Um, second of all, I know you started off that conversation with the fact that when you started at that prison, it was about mental health and find, you know, the, the funding being limited. So what I'm curious about is, how do you start a class like that with women with such a personal, you know, story to tell. Like, what's what's the process of allowing and finding that balance of that personal story within you, and also that creative nonfiction, putting it down onto paper. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, it wasn't all sunshine and roses when I started the, uh, you know, the workshop down at the prison because um, they were they were largely women who had been burned. But, and, and, and learned not to trust people, particularly 
white middle-aged guys, you know, which I was. Um, and um, so we had to, we had to kind of learn, we had to, we had to kind of get to know each other a little bit. Um, one, the, one of my students, Brenda, was a, um, she had been in a gang um, down in Waterbury, and um, she had been part of a beatdown um, in which the victim was killed. And, um, and nevertheless, she kept writing these sort of sunny stories about, and particular one she kept writing over and over, revised again and again, and it was about her uncle Carlos and how her family um, would drive to New York where he lived when he got cancer and go to visit him. And, um, and uh, you know, they were, it was kind of a sad story. Um, and after she submitted about, I don't know, the sixth draft or something, I said to her, Brenda, God bless Uncle Carlos, but if you, but if you kill him off one more time in the in your in your creative nonfiction, I said I may kill myself, and so she laughed and she said, "Well, what I really want to write about is my gang, you know, activities, um, but in order to repudiate the gang, um, they couldn't talk about it. That was one of the one of the rules of the institution, and so." Um, so I said, how about if I, if I got you permission to write about it, uh, do you think that would be valuable to you? And she said, um, yeah. She said, I think I could because I think I, I, have, I, I think I could learn more about why I fell into that. And so um, the warden okayed it. Um, and she started writing about you know, the gang stuff and really strong stuff. All of a sudden, you know, her writing you know, was like it. It, um, it broke through. <clears throat> so, um, but I think, you have, I think you have to trust, I think you have to earn trust for people um, in order for that to happen. Um, the women at the prison largely kept secrets and they had kept them for a long time. Um, and they had been told, you know, you shut your mouth about this, or I'm going to shut it for you. Um, what what goes on in this house stays in this house, and um, and so the women didn't, you know, they kept those secrets, and lar a lot of times the secrets were um, about sexual abuse, you know, being incested by your grandfather or um, your father, you know, that kind of thing, and. Um, and you could almost see it in their body language when they decided to trust themselves to write about this very secret private thing um, to out you know, the perpetrator. Um, and it was a way to, for, they, for them to sort of break through the chains that were, um, that were binding them and discover their voice. Uh, that was true of uh, Diane Bartholomew, the woman I was reading about earlier. Um, you know, she had, uh, her father uh, had incested her. And um, once she started writing and got that, and she told that secret, that's when she, that's when, you know, she couldn't, she couldn't stop. Um, so, I, I don't know, is, is, is that an okay answer to your question? Yes, it is. Thank you. All right. Sure. Thank you. Another student is asking you a question that sounds a little bit like one of those late night games that students <laughs> play. If there were a book about your life, what would the title be? <laughs> uh, well, let's see. Uh, who wrote The Idiot? Was it Kafka? <laughs> so that one's taken. I don't know. Um, I guess the title might be something I have learned. It's not very original, um, but it's something I, when I, before I turned 60, um, which is now mm, 11 years ago, um, I, I decided that I was gonna get a tattoo 
you know? <clears throat> my 60th birthday, I was gonna get a tattoo. And then I had to figure out what it was gonna say or what, what the image was gonna be. And I decided um, that I was gonna have a tattoo that said, love wins, love wins. And um, that'll be the title of my book. So this is my last question to you. It's been such a pleasure to have you here this evening. Thank you. Will you come back to Eastern? <laughs> I certainly will. I have a, I have a, a real fondness for this um, student-friendly organization. Um, uh, my sisters, way, way back when, I have two older sisters. Um, I'm the baby of the family. Um, but they both came here when it was Willimantic State Teachers College. Um, or before that, I guess it was called Willimantic Normal School, um, which I think had to do with teaching, not normalcy, right? And, um, uh, but, but I, you know, I used, I used to come up here when, when they were students here. Um, I used to live right down the, right down the street on Lewiston Avenue. Um, uh, we, li we lived there for about, I don't know, 15 years or something. So I have a fondness for Willimantic and I have a fondness for Eastern. Um, one, of the, one, of the best, um, one of the best things that ever happened to me was when um, I was asked to give the commencement address. This was several, several years back now. Um, but it, it was one of the highlights of, uh, of my career. Um, not so much getting one of those you know, gowns with the sash or whatever it is, but, um, but just being able to, you know, to talk to the students on, on a happy day, uh, and to end with their parents too. Um, so yes, I have a, I have a great fondness for this place, and I certainly will come back. In fact, you may never get rid of me. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah, sure. driving home now, okay? That's, a, that's, a, that's an order. <laughs> and also when you're walking back to your door. Adios. Thank you, everybody. Okay.